It is, uh, it's good to be with you this morning. I enjoyed our worship time. I really do appreciate all that the worship team does. I know that they uh, were here yesterday serving uh, during our celebration of life for our dear friend Steve Reed, who recently went home to be with the Lord and uh, did a mar- marvelous job just uh, uh, bringing us into God's presence then. Those of you who were here, I'm sure you uh, it's hard to say you enjoyed something, but after, afterwards, uh, several of the family members, including Terry, came up to me. She said, you know, I enjoyed that funeral. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, when you know where you're going, when you know that Christ has paid the price and you have peace with God, stepping to the next stage of your life is not nearly as scary as, uh, as it might seem. <laughs> So this morning, I want to welcome you. We're going to talk about serving together. We're continuing our series. It's been, uh, we've been doing 40 days of community, and our small groups, we've been discussing a number of the issues that I'll bring up today. We'll discuss in the following week as we gather together in homes across the community, online, and in various ways. Uh, all of our small groups seem to be growing, new people coming in, especially in our online groups. That's been very interesting. Folks that have never even been through the front door of our building have come on to and joined our online campus, and that's a real blessing and an encouragement. And so uh, really, really uh, love that and love what God's doing in it. And so uh, just want to really uh, encourage us. We welcome our online uh, family as well. Thanks for being with us. We are delighted to have you, and I want to remind you uh, or mention to you that, number one, you can download the notes if you're watching online. You can download the notes and have those available Uh, and you can follow along with the message as well. If you're in the building and you didn't get a set of notes, raise your hand, and someone will make sure they get those to you right away. I know there's a lot of blanks to fill in, and I do that to kind of hopefully help keep you engaged. I don't know if we should ever, maybe we should ask the question one day, do you like blanks or not like blanks? I don't know. Maybe you don't like notes at all, but anyway, they're there for you, and I hope that they will help you as uh, as you go forward. Also, uh, this weekend, uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll be launching our Next Step small group. So if you have not gone through Next Step, you've been signed up. I know a number of people have been waiting to go through that, and you would like to join us in that. There are books available on the back table as you walk out the door, and you can also sign up. Uh, you can do that simply by uh, sending an email to connect at church, and we'll get back with you and uh, help you get involved. So tonight, I think there are nine or ten folks in, a, in that uh, small group, and we have room for more, so we'd love to have you jump in with us. And so uh, today we're talking about serving together. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about what it means to, to be in a family, the family of God. We've been talking about what it means to let His presence work in our hearts and lives. We've been talking about learning and developing the most important attribute uh, for any Christ follower, and that is to learn to love others. It's really easy to say we love God, and most of us would maybe say that without any hesitation. But Jesus, or actually James, the Apostle James, said you can't say that you love God whom you haven't seen when you don't love your brothers and sisters who you have seen. So Jesus gave us a command. In fact, he was asked one day, what is the greatest command of all? Someone trying to, uh, really trying to trip him up and, and, and have reason to accuse him. And Jesus said, well, the greatest command, in fact, the whole Bible, uh, all the prophets, the law and the prophets, everything in the Bible hinges on this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he says the second is, like that, like unto that, in that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so for us to learn how to fulfill all that's demanded by the law and the prophets, we must learn how to love one another. Jesus further drives this lesson home to us, and this is not in your notes, but just be patient. I'll get to him in a second. He further drives this this point home to us when he says in John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, listen, I'm going to give you a new commandment today. He's talking to his disciples, all those that were Christ followers then and now. And that is that you must love each other even as I have loved you. And then in verse 34, he goes a little further 
And he says that uh, it, it, it's by loving one another, in your love for each other, everyone begins to know, begins to realize, recognizes that you are my disciple. Now, this is very important because Jesus, before he departs, gives the great commandment for all Christ's followers from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He says this, he says, look, I want you to go into all the world and I want you to tell all the people, all the nations, all the peoples of the earth, every people group, I want you to tell them about my love. Tell them what you've learned from me. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to do everything I have told you. And listen, I'm going to be with you even to the ends of the world. So you see, Christ gives us a great command and a great commission. He gives us the great command first that we love one another, the the, the big command is love God with all your heart, but then also be able to express that love for God by loving one another. And then he says, because if you do this, people, this will be the, the bona fide. This will be what causes people to recognize that you have experienced the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not in the sermon that you preach. It's not in the in the you know, the shirt that you wear, the cross that you put around. It's not in the bumper sticker. It's not even in the good works that we do. It's not whether we lay hands on the sick and see them recover. All those are supposed to be part and parcel of being a Christ follower. He says, but listen, people are not going to listen to your message unless they see you do something that is absolutely contrary to human nature, and that is love one another to the point that you're willing to lay down your life for one another. That's important stuff. That's important stuff. And that's why we've been talking about this for the last several weeks. You could think, well, maybe we just lack something else to talk about. But the truth is, is we'll never change the world if, first of all, we have not been changed. And if that change is not manifested at such a deep level that we're able to love others even who are different than us. Because how many of you have recognized, like I have, that there are some people that are, that are just different than I am and that you are. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, that's probably kind of good that we are different. I mean, the world would be really boring if we were all the same, right? Unless you were all like me, then it would be kind of perfect. But it, it probably wouldn't. We would get on each other's nerves. The reality of it is God calls us from different backgrounds with all kinds of different issues, but His life-transforming love breaks down barriers, breaks down walls, and brings transformation. If we're going to change the world, it's not going to be by how loud we speak or even how eloquent we speak, but how deeply we love. And that's just the truth. Now, I don't stand here and tell you, look, follow me because I've got this, I really have got this worked out. I know exactly what I'm doing. No, I'm learning with you as we go because it's not easy to love. People aren't always lovable, but God says his spirit in me will help me. In fact, it says in Galatians chapter 5 that love is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, an evidence that His Spirit is abiding in me. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Faith. He says, listen, if my Spirit is in you and you're surrendered to me and you're allowing my Spirit to live in you and guide you and direct you, these attributes of my nature, they're going to just come out of you. It takes surrender. It takes willingness to say no to my flesh, my old nature, and yes to him. But Holy Spirit abides within me now. I either open my heart and let him, let him flow through me, or I shut him down and kind of box him back up. No, my spirit will be with you, and he will ensure your success. He's going to empower you to do the things that I've called you to do. He's going to empower you to do things even greater than I've done, but it all is going to hinge, I believe. It's all going to be ratified by your ability to express love. To express love and acceptance. It's the one I believe I see in the Scripture. It's the one irrefutable sign that will convince them that you've been transformed, that your message has truth, that it bears witness. It is that which rings so true in our hearts. Would you say amen to that? 
And so wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever you're listening to this message, hear what I'm saying because I believe this is the greatest testimony that we're able to love one another the way that he loved us. And that's why we've been talking about it. That's why we've been talking about it in our small groups during this season of time, this period of time when things are so challenging and we're so apt to, you know, it, 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 there's a fine line between faith and fear. There's a fine line between suspicion and, and you know, judgment. And, and, you know, there's one thing in staying safe, another thing in just being, you know. So there's a whole place in our hearts where learning to love during this season is even more challenging, I think. Because it requires that we do something besides just talk. But it does require that we connect with one another. So I'd like to open into your notes now, dive into your notes now, by looking at our memory verse, which the kids will learn later on, but probably do you good to learn it as well. Because I believe it's really the linchpin for this entire message. It comes from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says this to the church in Philippi. He says, listen, I want you to agree with each other, loving one another and working together with one heart and one purpose. In other words, you've got to come to a place of agreement. How can two walk together unless they agree? Now, the thing that often separates us and divides us is because we're different. And learning how to love one another, learning how to to cooperate with one another, participate with one another, is part of becoming a mature Christ follower. It's, it, frankly, it's part of becoming a mature human being. How many of you know that you can, you can be 60 years old and still be at six in your emotions? You know, people see you walk through the door, they're even thinking you're, now that's a great guy, that's a grown man, or they're thinking, that, that's a baby. You know what I'm talking about. And so we have, to, uh, we have to kind of think through some of these things and work through some of these things and apply them to our lives. It's not enough just to talk about them. We must actually embrace them and do them. So working together with one heart, one purpose. Now, what is the purpose that we're called to? God says, I'm called you to change the world one person at a time, but to change them by the sharing of my gospel. Teach them the things that you've learned. Well, what have you learned? If you learn to love others, teach them how to love. That's the first thing you would teach them. Teach them how to get along with one another. Teach them how to help one another, those, those kind of things. And so, it, you know, it, it, it's, there's, there's a tendency to want to just break out my Bible and start teaching, you know, the whole gospel of John to someone. But sometimes it just becomes like the Charlie Brown teacher. Wah, wah, wah. Because words, though they are powerful, Unless there is life behind them, they just don't resonate with the soul. Does that make sense? So, how do we do that? Over the last several weeks, we've covered some of these, so I'm going to hit them quickly. But number one, we do that by remembering that we are a family. I'm talking about those that are in the body of Christ I'm talking about two things. One, the big C church and the little C church. I almost did it backwards like that was going to help. Is that right? Is that C to you? No? That? Okay. The big C church and the little C church. I shouldn't try to do those kind of things. Anyway, big C church. What is the big C church? The big C church is the church universal. It was originally called the Catholic Church, but we're not talking about the Catholic denomination or tradition. We're talking about the word Catholic, which means worldwide or universal. So there is a church that does not go by the name of First Baptist, Second Methodist, whatever. There is a church that over all the universe, over all the ages of time, that people who have been baptized into Christ, who place their faith and trust in Him, they are part of the big church. See, church, you are part of that church. You were baptized into Christ. You're part of that congregation. And as part of that congregation, that means that my friends who attend the Lutheran church that worship different than I do, they tend attend a high church and they only use, you know, uh, pipe organs and that sort of thing. They still, they worship differently than I do. They have different traditions, but they're still part of my spiritual family. Does that make sense? There are those that, that, Worship in Pentecostal churches, and, and while we may sometimes uh, seem close to them, we 
they're even more demonstrative than we are. We share many of the same beliefs, doctrines, and theology, but however, there's a, an, an emotional expression that maybe is different, but they're still part of our spiritual family. There are African churches. There are, there are uh, Korean churches. There are Chinese churches. They say some of the same things, but they use different words for all of them. I know because I've been there, and I'm thinking, I thought we were doing the Lord's Prayer, and I didn't understand the word, but I knew in my heart we were doing something together. But we're all part of the big C church, and it's really easy for me, and it's easy for you to say, you know, I love the church in Mozambique. I, lo I love them. I'd lay down my life for them as long as I don't have to go to Mozambique. <laughs> I would even give money to help that church in Korea as long as I don't have to go to Korea. You see, it's easy to love people from a distance, isn't it? It's somewhat easy, and it's somewhat easy to talk about them being my spiritual family. But then there's the little C church that comes into play too, and that's this congregation right here and every other congregation in our community. We see each other. We know each other. We do things together, or we should, because we've all been called to a spiritual family for the purpose of completing the work until all have heard that Jesus Christ is their Lord. In fact, by the way, let me just invite you, starting tomorrow night, there is a community revival that will actually be taking place at 3D Community Church. Now, they bought property out on 87 South, so uh, you actually want to go to Olivia on 87, and there they've got a big field to have lights and speakers and a tent and uh, a number of different speakers every night and worship teams every night, and they're just going to preach the gospel and pray for our nation as we are in this very challenging time time going forward. Their goal is not to talk about politics, but their goal is to bring God's presence into people's lives. They're praying for souls to be saved, hearts to be changed, lives to be transformed, and I want to encourage you to go be a part of that. And so every night, 6 o'clock from, from Monday night through Friday night, go be a part and enjoy what God's doing. I'm going to be there on a number of, uh, of those nights myself. So we are a family. Number one, we are a family. And as a family, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 says that we learn to work together. We work together as partners to do what God's called us to do because we belong to God. We are a family. You might want to circle that part about we work together. Sometimes we only want to do what we want to do, but there's a thing when the family you know, my wife and I, neither of us really ever like to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to change diapers or to clean up puke. But we always did it. I did because <laughs> I'm not really. Okay, my wife's here. <laughs> we did it because we're family, right? All right, number two. We also learned that in this season, as a family, we need each other. We need each other. Scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of Christ's body. Now, this comes from the Message Bible, and I just love the way he translates some things and makes it so plain. He says, but as a chopped-off finger or a cut-off toe, we wouldn't amount to very much, would we? And so you could say, I'm part of the big C church, or I'm even part of the little c church. I joined when I was seven years old. I was baptized when I was an infant. You can claim all those things, but listen, if you're not connected to the church, if you're not connected to your spiritual family, you're still not part of the family. Does that make sense? And you could say, I love my church, but if you never go, if you never connect, if you never work together to bring change and transformation, well, boys and girls, I got to tell you, you're really fooling yourself, and I want to encourage you to step up and step in. Number three, we get more done when we do things together. As every family knows this, if, just, if mom does all the work at home, then there's a lot of stuff that's not going to be done, and that which is done, you know, it, it just we do things together. We make the work easier when we pitch in and work together. Ecclesiastes 4.9 Two are better than one because together they can work more effectively. We all know that to be true. And I'll tell you, when I think about these 
three attributes or these three elements of what it means to be a part of the church and what it means to learn to love. I can think of no better example than what took place yesterday with our life celebration. I mean, people came together in our worship team and our hospitality center and in our uh, admin administration department. I mean, every team just worked together to bring about a celebration yesterday to bless the family and to honor the memory of our dear friend. And if you were here, you just have to shake your head. I mean, people gave testimonies. People uh, shared experiences. People, it was just awesome. But what it really reminded me was that we as a family were celebrating one of our family members. It was like sitting around at the table and, you know, at your birthday and everybody's telling, you know, telling the things they love about you, like about you. It's about, it's about that. And it really, we just really experienced family in that brief time, people that we didn't even know, but yet there was a divine connection because of God's love for us. And I really want to say thank you to everyone who worked, Mark up in the booth, everybody, the sound team, everybody that worked so hard to make that thing work, the worship team who practiced and prayed and sought God. It was, it was really awesome, and I want to say thank you on their behalf. And I also want to remind you, no matter what part you played, maybe the part you played was coming and just praying for the family and encouraging the family. The Scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, doesn't matter whether you're the one that plants or you're the one that waters, you work as a team for the same purpose. And the Bible says that regardless of whether you're the, the planter or the waterer, we all get the same reward. Does that make sense? And so as a spiritual family, that's what happens for us as we work together. So let me help you real quick with some thoughts about what it means, what it takes to serve together, some practical things that will help you to take a step forward in your life, hopefully. I want to use the word uh, team as an acronym, and I know we hate acronyms, but, but just bear with me and let's work through this. So number one, if we're going to work together as a team, if we're going to work together as a family, if we're going to do something effectively to, effective to change the world together as a congregation, then we got to learn to trust one another. Now, one of the things that we're doing in our small groups is talking about several small and several large outreaches. In one conversation we've had, we've talked about putting together uh, Thanksgiving meals for hundreds of people. But I'll tell you, we can't do that alone. It's going to take all of us sacrificing, all of us participating to do that. And we want to do that for those that might be in need. Paul says to Timothy, guard that which has been entrusted into your care. In other words, when God puts something before you, an opportunity, or he gives you a responsibility as he did with Timothy. Now, Timothy had the gospel. He was preaching uh, to the churches that were brand new. He was working in Asia Minor under Paul's ministry. He was ordaining elders in churches. He was doing a number of things. And Paul said, look, be faithful. Guard that which has been given to you. Carry out your duties and responsibilities in another place as a good soldier. Don't get entangled with the things of the world. I want you to be effective at what you're doing. And if you are going to become effective in working with others, it's imperative that you build trust in them. Not only trust in the things that you do, but in the way you live your life. And can I just say, that's just also a part of being a mature individual, becoming emotionally mature. The writer of Proverbs says it this way, many people claim to be loyal, but have a hard time. It's hard to find a trustworthy person, a person that you can say, I can really trust them. If, if David says he's going to do it, you can know that it's going to get done. And that's what maturity does. And that's what we do and how we build relationships with one another. Now, here are three simple tr keys that I believe will help you in learning how to build trust with others. And uh, it, it, listen, this applies to every relationship, not just being in church. This applies to your family. It applies to your marriage. It applies to your work. It applies to your school. Every one of these, these are really keys to spiritual and emotional maturity, which is what God's calling us to do, to grow up. And not just live for myself, but to live for others as well. So number one, we need to learn to be consistent. Be consistent in your life. You ever met someone that one day they're one way, the next day they're another way? Uh, you ever met someone that you think you can trust them to do something and you just never really know? They might do it or might not do it. They might do it on time or they might not do it on time. They might do it with excellence or they might just flip it off and do it a little bit at a time. 
The Bible says in Luke chapter 16, whoever can be trusted with very little things can also be trusted with much. And see, I want you to understand, as Christ followers, God brings into our lives little opportunities to serve others, little opportunities to step into the service of the Lord, to take the weight of others' lives on our shoulders. And he gives us those opportunities so that as we step through them, just like any muscle, just like any exercise, we improve as we go forward. So if we're faithful in small things, he says, I will trust you with more things. And that doesn't always mean, you know, that means if I do a little bit at church, I got to do a lot. No, it means that in your life, you say you want to experience God's blessing. How many of you would like to have God's blessing, his righteousness, his peace, his joy? Those are gifts given to us. How many of you want to break free from the chains of your past, break free from those habits, from, from those hurts, God, those hang-ups that we've been hanging on to? How many of us want to step into that new zone with God? Well, the only way to do that is to take that step. It's one of the reasons that we read the Bible together every morning or during the day. We're going through the Bible together. It's not that, you know, it's like when we finish reading this chapter, oh, what a day it'll be. No, it's not that. It's that little things done regularly, intentionally, bring change and transformation. Are you with me? And so reading the Bible together, praying, even just praying the Lord's Prayer, it may seem like a small thing, but every small thing done done with intention and done regularly brings transformation. You don't believe it? Eat an apple pie. Even one slice of apple pie every day for the next 36 days. You know what's going to happen? You're going to improve your waistline considerably. Now, by that, I mean it's going to grow. <laughs> Everything that you exercise grows, right? I know this because, anyway, I won't tell you how. But be consistent. Be consistent. Number two, Listen, learn how to be confidential. When someone trusts you, when someone asks you, when someone shares something with you, don't, don't be a gossip, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13. Don't run your mouth about it. Be a person who is confidential, can keep someone's confidence so they can trust you to pray through, trust you to give them help. That's just maturity. That's learning to grow up. I mean, every kid remembers when, you know, you had a paddletail in the room and a blabbermouth. But learning to speak in love and to cover someone, listen, to cover someone's weakness. You know, that's what the Bible said Jesus did for us. It says he atoned for your sin. The word atone means to cover. It means to cover. And so... When you cover someone's sin, I'm not talking about you turn a blind eye. I'm not talking about you excuse. I'm talking about when you cover and do not speak to others about it. You have done the same thing. You've loved them in the way that Jesus loved you. And you have taken that to the Father and you've asked God to help them with that situation. E, next in your outline, is the word empathy. Empathy. Now, I looked this up for you because I didn't know if you would know what it is because I sometimes get a little, I get empathy and sympathy and other, all these pathoses mixed up sometimes. And so I thought it would be good for you to know what that meant. And, and if you're going to develop emotional maturity and intelligence, this is really important because it means becoming aware of yourself and aware of others. It's the ability to understand and to share in the feelings of other people. People. And that's why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, says to live in harmony with one another and be sympathetic to one another. I mean, take one another's emotions and, and understand them. Begin to work with them. Recognize that not everybody's like you. I remember someone helping me to understand the differences between men and women and and uh, actually, it was not even the difference between men and women, but rather it was kind of the understanding of how some people react to issues that happen differently. And he used the illustration of taking a pebble and putting it, throwing it into the water, just dropping it into the water. And when the pebble hit the water, what happened? The pebble went in, went to the bottom, right? You don't see it anymore. But something happened. There were concentric circles, waves that went out from it. 
And, and he helped me to understand that whenever you say something, whenever you do something, whenever something happens in a person's life, that it causes these concentric waves of emotion that keeps hitting them, and often the enemy amplifies them. And sometimes, just because a person uh, maybe is immature, they amplify them themselves. But then again, sometimes because you've been hurt so many times. You ever had, a, had an ingrown toenail? Oh, isn't that just lovely to talk about in church? But you know what I'm talking about. You have an ingrown toenail, and it's like all you have to do is just bump it, and oh, my goodness, pain goes through your entire being, doesn't it? Ever had a, a splinter in your hand? All you have to do is touch it, and it's like you, you, know, you know you've got to get it out, but you'll do anything to try to protect yourself. And so empathy, understanding when people feel the way they feel, they feel it. It doesn't matter that it's rational to you. They feel it. They're experiencing that shock wave. Does that make sense? And as we as mature believers understand that, we don't necessarily have to fix it, but we can put our arms around them either physically or emotionally and help them as they go through that process. Now, how do we do that? Number one, slow down a little bit. Slow down and take time. The Bible says in James, be quick to listen and slow to speak. One of the one of the sure signs of immaturity in a, in, a, in a person who wants to minister, in fact, it happens with all of us, is the minute someone begins sharing a problem or sharing a challenge, you begin sharing your answer. And another way we do that is we, we listen to their story, and then we tell them another story, which our story is better than their story. And this is supposed to illustrate, are you listening to me? This is supposed to illustrate how God's going to help them. Now, if anybody comes up to me after church and say, that's what you did to me the last time, I, uh, j- just, just know I'm learning, I'm growing. But that's what we do often. Slow down, though, and don't be quick to speak. In fact, if you want to speak, be quick to pray. Because, you know, when you talk to the Father, the Father knows exactly what's going on. You don't. It's never what it appears to be. Never, 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 never what it appears to be. I prayed with a family just last night, and I won't go into the details, but it was a very, very difficult situation, and they're not part of our congregation, and this happened on another coast, but but it was a very, very difficult situation, and it would have been easy for me to shift into, well, if you do this and if you do that. But I knew immediately all I needed to do was say, listen, I am so sorry that happened. This must really impact you. This must really concern you. And I knew that it did, and I felt that it did. And I also knew that no matter how much book knowledge I've got, all the degrees that I've earned over the years and my wife has accumulated, and all the classes we've taught, that would do no good. All they needed to hear was, listen, I love you. Jesus loves you, and he's going to help you through this time. Let me pray for you right now. I didn't counsel. I didn't give them, you know, my faith answer. I just listen. Slow down. Don't be quick to answer. Allow God time to speak. Many times he speaks to them while you're praying, and they hear from God. And when I'm going to tell you, when you hear from God, faith arises in your heart. You don't have to be God's spokesperson all the time. But if you're slow to speak, if you're quiet and you're prayerful, then God will use you in ways that you did not even expect. Remember it says in Job 33, God is always speaking. We're just not always listening. Number two, ask questions. Not probing questions that are designed to embarrass or to get down to the, you know, the nitty-gritty of things. But listen, a person's thoughts are like water in a deep well. And someone with insight, someone with real compassion can begin to draw that out. And I did experience that as I was talking with this. Just ask one question. And it opened the door for that parent to talk about years of struggle. And suddenly we were able to pray not just about the moment they were in, but about the years of pain and struggle they had had. So ask leading questions that allows and even invites others to participate. Remember, it's a gift that God's given you, the opportunity to pray with them, the opportunity to listen, the opportunity to ask questions, and don't ever forget this. No matter how many times you've heard it from how many different people, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you genuinely care. Number three, 
learn to show emotions. I'm not talking about get blubber brains out there, but I am talking about uh, what the Scripture says in Romans 12. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I'll tell you, yesterday was, you know, I, you don't know how to react. You don't know how to respond. But when she, when Terry was here, and, you know, in the beginning she was very, you know, mourning was coming into, and, and naturally so, grieving the loss of her lifelong companion, but as we moved forward and as we celebrated the life they had together, you could see courage, you could see hope, you could see joy begin to abound in her soul. But there was a moment where I just sit in their home and I held both their hands when they had received that very difficult news. And we just wept together. I'm not telling you I'm a perfect pastor. I am, and you know that. But it's not that I'm a perfect. But sometimes it's just a matter of listening. And meeting them right where they are, not having the answers, not being super Christian, not being Mr. Faith or Mr. Word. Sometimes you just need to listen. I'll never forget when our granddaughter, our first granddaughter, <clears throat> who was just with us for a few hours, we were headed to her, um, her memorial service. And my pastor texted me, Michael Fletcher. And um, I, I, you know, I, I picked up my phone and looked at it, and he says, I'm weeping with you right now. That's all he said. I'm weeping with you right now. And I'll tell you, it just waves of the Father's love came over my heart. It didn't take away the anguish, didn't take away the pain, but I felt his strength come under me. Are you with me? We're almost through, guys. A is accommodate. We just have to learn how to... Uh, work together to be able to accommodate others and allow for, for, for who they are and who they're becoming. None of us are where we want to be, but we're all in the journey. We're on the journey together. Second Timothy chapter 2, be faithful, loving, and easy to get along with. Remember that some people are what we call extra grace required people. Now, none of you are that way, and I'm Still working on getting over my propensity to lie. But anyway, none of you are that way. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're all that way. We're all that way. Just ask anyone who knows me. There are moments when I'm hard to like because I'm human. And I'm still being transformed by the precious grace of God just like you are. Let me give you four quick ways that will help you enable, uh, enable you to accommodate others. And, and listen, this is really good for your work as well, and, I, I, and, and we're really almost done. Number one, look, accommodate each other's needs. Not everybody is as strong as you are. Maybe not everybody has the same abilities you are. Maybe some people have other needs that you don't necessarily have, and they may seem weird or maybe seem, you know, but just learn to accommodate. Learn to make space and not dismiss someone. Oops. One swipe too many will take you straight to the end. Number two, each <laughs> learn to accommodate each other's ideas. This is really hard because I have all the best ideas. I'm always right. Come on, church. You know it's right. I'm always right. And then you come and bring me some idea, and it's like, now, wait a minute. That makes a lot more sense than what I was thinking. And if we learn to listen to one another, God can speak. He's always speaking. We're not always listening. God doesn't always give you every word. He uses the body. Otherwise, we don't need each other. But if we recognize that we are a part of his family and we do need each other, we can listen to one another. We can accommodate each other's personalities. And that takes some challenges. I mean, it takes some work. But remember, God gave each one of us different kind of gifts. Some of you are like, man, you're always in a party mood. Some of you are like Eeyores. It's just your personality. And, you know, we can, but, but we're all needed and we're all part of one another. Number four, remember to accommodate each other's faults. We all have hurts, hangups, and habits that we're still breaking free from. And number five, remember that we're all on the same mission. You see, loving each other, loving each other is God's calling card to the world. They're part of my family. I've worked in their lives. They are 
on the same team with me. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Be of the same time, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Well, what is that purpose? As the great commission that Jesus Christ gave us. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, live in a way that brings honor to God. Brings honor, I'm sorry, to the good news of Christ. Standing strong with one purpose, working together as one for the faith of the good news. Learning to love each other puts us in that place. It brings us back to that ultimate purpose that God created us for. We say it all the time, you were created on purpose for purpose. You're not an accident. And of all the things God created you for, and all the things that God designed you for, all the reasons He he made you the way you are, the personalities, the gifts, the skills, the, the resources, all the different things, from the, listen, from the height, you know, how tall you are, to how short you are, to the color of your skin, to the language that you speak, to your parents, to your great-grandparents, all of those things uniquely form who you are that God wanted to use so that you would be able to express God's love to people that would understand it best through you. Go into all the world and make disciples of every people group. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything that I have taught you to do. And I'll be with you even unto the ends of the world. This is the most powerful. Listen, love is the most powerful tool. It's the most powerful gift, skill that we can learn and develop because it is love, the ability to love others that absolutely verifies the message that you're sharing. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our time together. And Lord, I pray that this message would resonate with our hearts. I know there's lots of writing. There's always lots of writing. But God, I pray that in our writing, it reminds us as we think through it later that that these, these truths, these principles, Lord, they're not just to be tossed out. They're to be thought about that we bring them together to formulate an understanding, a, a, a doctrine, a theology of love, your love, that, that God's love is one without hooks. God's love is one that draws people to you, not draws people to me. God's love is one that brings healing and understanding and grace. And the truth of it is, without your love, I would never have come to know you. Without your love, there's not one person in this room that would have ever experienced life transformation. But because of your love, we've been changed forever. And Lord, there are people in our lives that you want to impact just as deeply, just as eternally as you did us. So help us, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name to grow up, to become mature, to be your family. To wherever we go, Lord, to present the calling card of the Holy Spirit, which is simply that we love others the way you love us. In Jesus' name. If you'd mind, keep your heads bowed just for one more moment, one more quick prayer. If you're here today and you're listening online and you've never come to a place where you've receive that kind of love personally to experience that kind of acceptance and total transformation I want to invite you right now I'd like to pray a simple prayer and I want to invite you to pray it with me and listen you don't have to join anything you don't have to you know cut your hair a special way give money none of that all you need to do is just open your heart and and believe and pray and ask and receive And I believe it will launch you on the pathway of eternal transformation. Here's how you do that. First, you believe. 
you believe that God is righteous and you're not. He's holy and you're not. And you just confess to him, God in heaven, I confess to you, I am a sinner. I've chosen my way and it's been different than your way, but I recognize that and I'm wanting to come to you right now. Lord, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me and I ask you to come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I ask you to forgive my sins and restore me to the Father and give me life eternal in Jesus' name. I receive the gift of salvation by faith right now for your glory, for my good. In Jesus' name, amen. And listen, if you prayed that, that's a simple prayer, and I believe it's just a baby step forward. I believe it's the right step at this moment to help you take your next step in becoming a mature believer in Jesus Christ, experiencing His goodness, His transformation. We've just accepted His gift of reconciliation, Him covering all your sin, past, present, future, and giving to you the opportunity to have a relationship with the Father unabated forever and ever like you to let me know if you prayed that we want to help you we want to pray for you we want to walk with you through this just send us an email or connect with me after the service it's connect at manna.church I'd like to ask the rest of you to stand as we get ready to dismiss love you and thank you so much for being with us today appreciate you being in this first the early service and helping us with all that is necessary to make you know things go forward just lift your hands I want to speak God's blessing over you thank you Father Lord, I thank you for everyone that's here right now. And Lord, I just speak your blessing over them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give unto you his peace, peace that passes all understanding. May that be your gift today as you walk out of here, knowing that your lame name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You have been forever changed and you're learning and growing more and more in love with Jesus and in love with those he brings into your life as you leave today remember <laughs> he blessed you to be the head and not the tail he he says about your life that you are like a city set on a hill he says about you that that you really are a light for the world to see but it's not so they can see you it's rather to see Christ in you the hope of glory so go change the world in Jesus name amen God bless you welcome again thank you for being with us today thank you for coming if you're a first time guest we're so honored that you shared with us we'd love to talk with you after service God bless you you're dismissed take a deep breath